time. Well, so now what we were discussing earlier during the session is that this is a second session for the subject. And the last class we discussed about the, uh, please, uh, you know, um, close your videos, please. Close your videos. Thank you. Close your videos. Okay, thank you. So uh, last class we discussed about, um, you know, how the international law of the sea evolved over the years how there were these marine powers like Portugal and Spain. They were these marine powers way back, several years back, and how they, you know, claimed a certain territory beyond a certain waters beyond the territorial seas. Those days there was no demarcation. But then there was Hugo Grotius who came up with Mare Liberum and he spoke about the that seas being a natural resource that everybody has got access uh, to the sea, he said. And then, like, well, you know, you know, slowly the laws started developing and evolving over the years. The laws got concretized, and then we had this United Nation Conventions. Uh, first, we had the Law of the Sea. Then we had this United Nation Convention of 1953, and then we came up with you know 1982 Convention and so on. And that is uh, the law that we have today is quite a refined form uh, of. Uh, you know, all the precedents that were laid in the international arena. Just like Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, he, he is a jurist and he is a famous philosopher, and he said to have remarked once that laws are a result of just not logic, but it is a result of experience. So exactly there has been, you know, precedents laid down uh, through various, uh, you know, kind of uh, tiffs or, you know, kind of conflicts that were there between nations when it came to tapping of resources from the seas, so as to claiming certain areas as coming under their jurisdiction and so on. And as a result of these conflicts and as a result, a result of, uh, you know, development uh, in the area of trade, in the area of commerce, and so on in the area of you know finding new resources exploration discoveries and, and as everything started improving the laws started improving and the time came when they said no we have to have defined set of rules and regulations so as to you know govern the nations and so that the nations also are able to govern themselves and set certain rules and set certain boundaries in the best interest of maintaining peace and security of their own boundary as well as their neighbors. Well, so having said the perspective, now let us go to our slides and go to the second chapter what, where we are going to deal with the marine areas as well as um, the, you know, the right of innocent passage of foreign vessels over territorial seas. I remember last class I taught you what is the definition of territorial sea and contiguous zones and so on. So go, we delve into uh, these aspects as well a little bit more deeper during this class. Okay. So maritime areas and right of innocent passage. Now, under the general maritime areas, we have certain concepts or certain demarcations which are made over the seas or even the waters of, of you know, the world, of course, of the different states, of the different nations. So internal waters, what are internal waters? We discussed it during the last class as well, but just as a reiteration in this uh, chapter as well, internal waters, uh, or our waters or internal water is water over which the state or a particular government, a coastal state, exercises complete sovereignty, just as, of course, as I said earlier, we discussed in the last chapter. Now, what is a territorial sea? Territorial sea is that portion of the ocean where the states exercise sovereignty, but there exists a right of innocent passage for foreign vessels without harming the rights of the state over the territorial sea. Now, the territorial sea, of course, extends up to 12 nautical miles from the baseline that is the low water mark of a particular coastal state. 
Then we spoke about even the, in the last class and as a reiteration here, contiguous zones, which are maritime areas, general maritime areas, in the international law perspective, in the law of sea perspective, contiguous zones are zones that measure from the end of the 12 nautical miles of the territorial sea up to 24 nautical, nautical miles, that is 44 kilometers approx, thus forming a contiguous zone. For example, we have canals and straits and so on. Example of straits is the Gibraltar Strait. Example, uh, you know, there are straits even in Malta uh, and so on. That is uh, Turkish Straits, Russia and so on. Well, so then next is international straits. Now, what is international straits? The Commander's Handbook on the Law of Naval Operations in WP9, that is the most recent one, has defined a strait and conveyed that straits are used for international navigation between one part of the high sea or an exclusive economic zone and another part of the high sea or an exclusive economic zone. We'll see what are the EEZ as well in the subsequent slide. Now, the definition for the international uh, straight. This particular definition is derived from the UNCLOS 1982, that is the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Seas, under Article 37 and 38 of 1982 uh, Convention. So the Free Dictionary defines international straits as an outlet from en enclosed seas to the high seas that have a special legal status. So the rules of navigation in such straits are regulated by special international agreements that in many cases contain restrictions on the entry into enclosed seas by warships of countries without coastline on those seas. So thereby there are two factors that comes to the fore about these straits. One is the ability to connect water bodies and two is the use of these straits for navigation. So thus straits operate as international transit passage. Of course, I gave you an example earlier that Strait of Gibraltar and the Turkish Strait to Russia and so on. Next is the EEZ or the Exclusive Economic Zone, also called as Maritime Continental Margin. The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea 1982 defined the, the uh, Exclusive Economic Zone as an area of the sea in which a sovereign state has special rights regarding the exploration and the use of marine resources, including energy production from water and wind, and it stretches from the outer limit of the territorial sea, 12 nautical miles from the baseline, out to 200 nautical miles. So now you see the, the area that it covers, 12 nautical miles from the baseline, out to the 200 nautical miles from the coast of the area in question. So therefore EEZ is an area which is adjacent to the territorial sea. Territorial sea is how much? 12 nautical miles from the baseline of a particular coastal state. So from there, extending up to 200 nautical miles, it comes to around 370 kilometers out from the coastal baseline. Thereby, now again, the contiguous zones may also come within the ambit of EEZ as well. So it may even encompass even sometimes artificial islands. So the states or the coastal states have jurisdiction over the resources of the area under this EEZ. And for what is it used? Economic zones for the purpose of exploitation of resources, extraction of resources, conservation, or even tapping of all sorts of living and non-living uh, living resources like fishing, or tapping sea minerals, oil and gas, allied resources, and so on, etc. So next is the continental shelf. So as you can see the picture there, what is a continental shelf? From the coast, you have the continental shelf, then you have a continental slope, continental rise, and then the ocean. So continental shelf is the is actually the ocean floor. So it is the, it is that area that lies towards the edge of the continent in the water. You see, there is a you, you see uh, you, you see the geographical area of a continent. For example, continent of Africa. So towards the edge of the continent, there are waters. So it's water where much of the explore, uh, exploring and exploitation of resources takes place. So the continental margin comprises the components like, you know, the continental rise that you can see there, continental slope that you can see there, and the continental shelf. So in this area called the continental shelf, most of the tapping and extraction of resources takes place. So it is that portion, therefore, of a continent that is submerged under an area of relatively shallow water known as a shelf area. So therefore it is this, this area that is called as a continental shelf where maximum of extraction of resources or 
you know, tapping of resources takes place. Next is the high seas. Now, high seas are classified as, of course, areas behind national jurisdiction. Why? It is beyond the territorial sea. It is beyond the EEZ. So areas beyond the national jurisdiction, which forms an extraterritorial space beyond the territorial seas and the state jurisdiction. So waters beyond the territorial seas are international waters or the high sea or which every nation or you know, state or coastal state can freely use. As Grotius advised us that the sea is no man's property and can be freely used by anyone and everyone as natural resource. Now, however, in the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, 1982, they tailored the right to if to the effect to encourage the legitimate use of resources and the use of the sea for transit. Now, in Article 87, sub Article 2 of the Convention, it generally restricts the freedom and states that it must be exercised with appropriate respect for the interest of other nations. That is, you know, you use the high seas, but in the you know in the in, uh, in a way that you do not harm the rights of other nations you use it in a legitimate way so use it in such a way that while you're using it you know you use the liberty to use the high seas but do not do anything that is illegitimate or would cause harm to the peace and tranquility of the other nations so like like you know illegal activities or criminal activities are obviously forbidden and certainly would constitute an international offense now example what are the examples of illegal activities like privacy sorry piracy i mean piracy slave trade etc so every nation or state has got a right to sail its flying uh, uh, to sail its vessel flying its flag over the high seas. Now, high sea is defined by the Merriam-Webster's Dictionary as an open ocean, especially that not, that's not within any country's jurisdiction. That means it, no, no, the high seas is beyond the territorial waters. It is beyond the economic zone. So therefore, it does not come within the territorial limits of any nation. Therefore, it, 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 it does not come within the state laws as well. It cannot come within any particular country's jurisdiction. You know, it is some. It is based upon the principle of Hugo Grotius, where he says that sea is no man's property, so every nation can use it. But illegitimate use of the sea is not permitted. Illegal use of the sea is not permitted. Hampering or causing harm to the other nations around is not permitted. On an obvious note. So illegal activities, criminal activities are forbidden and it certainly constitute an international offense. Like example, again, reiterating piracy, slave trade, and so on. You cannot use the high seas for transportation of slaves and so on. Like how it used to happen in the past. That's why I said like the laws have evolved over years. It has developed. And as, you know, uh, Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, Justice Oliver Wendell, he said that, Again, I'm reiterating this. He said that um, that lie that laws are a result not of logic but experience. Next is archipelagic water. What is an archipelago? It is a chain of islands spread across an area. Like for example, you know, you have a chain of Philippine islands. I've seen a chain of even islands in Seychelles. So. What is an archipelago? It's a chain of islands. It's just spread across in an area. Example, of course, Andaman and Nicobar Islands in India, Lakshadweep Island of India, the Hawaiian Islands, the Canary Islands, and so on. So the waters and the seas that surround the archipelagos are termed as archipelagic waters. Now, as per United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, Article 47, an archipelagic state may draw straight archipelagic baselines joining the outermost points of the outermost islands and drying reefs of the archipelago, provided mm -hmm. that within such baselines are included the main islands and an area in which the ratio of the area of the water to the area of the land, including, just a moment, including atolls is between one to one and nine to one, that is the ratio. So the length of such baselines shall not exceed 100 nautical miles, except that up to 3% of the total number of baselines 
enclosing any archipelago may exceed the length up to the maximum length of 125 nautical miles. So this is, uh, you know, the description that is given by Article 47, in, like so as to in what way these baselines need to be drawn and what can be the definition of these archipelagos and how they can, you know, uh, secure their rights with respect to tapping of resources around the waters around the waters of the archipelagos or these islands which, which are spread across a particular area. So further in Article 48, it states that the breadth of the territorial sea, the contiguous zone, the EEZ and the continental shelf shall be measured from the archipelagic baselines drawn as clearly stipulated in Article 47. So uh, this is a picture you can see territorial waters extends up to 12 nautical miles from the coastal baseline of the coastal state. Then we have plus 24 nautical miles, uh, which comprises of the contiguous zones. And then further on, you have this um, from the contiguous zone to the, uh, you know, the other's end. You have 200 nautical miles where the area can be demarcated and can be called as EEZ. Next is innocent passage. This is again a very interesting principle of the law of the sea, the right of innocent passage. Now, this is a foundational principle which you know is uh, which is rooted in the doctrine uh, of uh, you know sea being a natural resource and thereby it being accessible to every human. So, this particular principle of of innocent passage. It propagates freedom of navigation. However, in modern and you know contemporary philosophy upon which the law of the sea has evolved, the sea is amenable to the sovereignty of the country around or in which it flows. And thereby, the coastal country state can impose legitimate restriction on the free use to the extent of avoiding illegal activities or activities that are detrimental to the peace and sovereignty of the coastal state and may require certain obligations and protocols to be met by the foreign ship vessels before they enter the territorial seas. So what we are talking about here is the right of innocent passage. You know, even foreign vessels have the right of innocent passage over the territorial seas. Now, you know that, as we discussed earlier, who has jurisdiction over the territorial seas? The coastal states. So the coastal states, See, there is a coastal state here. So the area around, of course, it has got the right over that area. So that area that it has got right, the 12 nautical miles, we call it as the territorial sea. Now, these, this particular area, sometimes it can allow foreign vessels to pass by. That is a right of innocent passage. So what is innocent passage? Vessels or foreign vessels that fly in these territorial waters legitimately, you know, without harming the peace and security of the, the coastal state or peace and tranquility of the coastal state, you know, if it passes by, it has the intention of just move or use that particular passage, it is called the right of innocent passage. So international law of the sea gives right to the foreign vessels to pass through the territorial waters of any coastal state or a country. A country who can exercise right or has sovereignty or has jurisdiction over particular territorial waters or seas. Uh, just before we move further, in case we get disconnected, please join back. I hope not. But it seems like, but you know, okay. Well, so let us continue. So now the question is, if the state allows, you know, innocent passage to foreign vessels, how can it be sure? Like what can be the measures that the coastal state can take to, you know, see that, that there is no harm that can be caused to it or just it has got the right to know that what are, 
which vessels or what type of vessels are passing by. So for that, most of the nations have devised protocols. Okay. So some one particular protocol is now you just intimate, you know, to the concerned authority that this foreign vessel it, it seeks permission to pass by. Or it, this particular foreign vessel, it just, you know, notifies that yes, it will be passing by. Or it has to say seek special permission, authorization to pass by. So it depends. Different countries have adopted various, you know, protocols. Some countries say, like, no, you cannot pass pass through this territorial waters unless you seek special permission or seek special authorization, and only then you'll be allowed to pass by. Some say, no, you just intimate to us, we must know that you are passing by. Some say that, no, you can pass by, but you're not supposed to carry, uh, say, any kind of material or goods that would, you know, that would, uh, you know, uh, pollute uh, my area, pollute the territorial seas that belong to us. So, for example, anything like industrial waste or any fluxes or industrial waste or, you know, you know, they're not allowed to carry those waste materials, uh, you know, for the fear that it can spill over and pollute the territorial seas. So let us see in the other slides, like what are those examples which I've already given there, in fact. So coming back to the right of passage, it being the fundamental right, it is granted under the international law of the sea, which is practiced under the sufferance of the coastal state through which waters, through whose waters the foreign vessel sails. Now, it can be considered as deemed sufferance or deemed permission by the coastal state for international passage subject to legitimate restrictions. They may pose restrictions. They may come up with certain laws because it is within their jurisdiction. They can come up with certain laws saying that you need to comply with these particular regulations in case you want to pass by that is, to, in case you foreign vessels want to pass by our territorial waters. Like prior notification, as I said earlier, may have to be provided, depending upon the jurisdiction of the coastal state, by the foreign ships before entering certain territorial waters. For example, UAE, Maldives, etc. This is the procedure that they follow, just notification. Some coastal areas require prior notification and authorization that a special permission to be sought before entering the territorial waters. Example, Oman, Seychelles etc. They adopt this particular protocol. Some countries prohibit the use of the territorial sea for the transportation of destructive weapons. They say no, you can use, but you know, you're not allowed to carry destructive weapons, weapons, mass destruction weapons. Example of, of this uh, kind of countries or the countries that have adopted this protocol is Lithuania and Romania. So some countries have prohibited the transportation of waste and refuse in the territorial waters with the apprehension of spills and consequent pollution. For example, is Haiti. Now, in the case of foreign warships, that is, what are foreign warships? Naval ships or vessels that may, may be engaged in war, carrying ammunitions of war. So some countries require notification for the use of the territorial waters. Example, India. Next is Cro Croatia and Egypt as well adopt this particular protocol that is uh, foreign warships they require notification for the use of the territorial waters of India, Croatia and Egypt. Now some countries require notification and authorization permission in case of warship passage for example UAE and Oman. So when it comes to warships UAE and Oman says not just notification you have to seek special permission. Okay okay next now <clears throat> The passage here is in terms of foreign vessels using the passage, a particular route via the territorial waters or even the high sea, subject to certain restrictions. The foreign submarines, now how do submarines move? You know, they move, uh, like in case of this, they're required to navigate at the surface of the sea rather than moving as a submarine while passing through the territorial sea. It, means it has to be prominent. Now, if the foreign vessel uses the passage for any criminal activity or in a way that causes threat or there is a use of force or an act that disturbs the peace and tranquility of a specific coastal state, then such an act would be considered as a violation of international law as stipulated in the UN Charter. So thereby, passage will be considered as innocent so far as nefarious or illegal activity is avoided. Thus, 
foreign ships are allowed peaceful entry and navigation into the territorial waters of another state, except in circumstances that may be considered as abusive of the rights of the coastal state and detrimental to its peace and security. Now, Article 17 of the United Nations Convention, Law C3, it defines the right of innocent passage as subject to this convention, ships of all states, whether coastal or landlocked, enjoy the right of innocent passage through territorial sea. Next, a direct presumption is drawn that the navigation of the foreign vessel is peaceful and innocent unless proved contrary by the coastal state. So normally there is a presumption drawn that the navigation of a foreign vessel is peaceful unless it can be proved by the coastal state that no, it is not. There is something, they, they kind of suspect something that is illegitimate or su some nefarious activity that probably is intended by the foreign vessel. So the states can nevertheless limit the wide interpretation and usage of this law with their domestic laws under the rule of sovereignty as exercising jurisdiction over the territorial waters. Now, as per the law of the Sea Convention of 1958, the coastal states can suspend innocent passage in certain designated areas in their control and at the legitimate discretion, of course. So some countries do not permit innocent passage over territorial waters. For example, some countries say, no, you're not allowed, you know, uh, innocent passage over ter our territorial waters at all. For example, Saudi Arabia. Thereby, it all depends upon coastal states, promulgations, that is laws, legislations over the use of territorial waters in the exercise of sovereignty over the territorial waters. So do you have any questions? Next class, we'll deal with chapter three and four. Do you have any questions? Okay, so I think we are done. I've got your names in the chat box for your attendance. And again, a gentle reminder before we close, Please submit your assignments on time. Thank you and bye-bye and see you next class. Bye.